down to business. This evening, I have the honor and pleasure of introducing our leader, the president of the National Urban League, Mr. Mark H. Morial. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. One more time for Jordan Quinn. Welcome, Urban Leaguers, to our 104th, that's right, 104th National Urban League Annual Conference in the great city of Cincinnati. Uh, let me uh, express my thanks uh, to Mayor John Cranley and the people of this city for greeting us with open arms. Eleven years ago, the Urban League movement made a principal decision to pull our annual conference out of Cincinnati due to significant issues with police and community relations. But we made a decision to return this year, largely because of the persuasive efforts of Donna Jones Baker, CEO of the Urban League of Greater Southwestern Ohio. And the immediate past mayor of this city, Mayor Mark Mallory. They never, never stopped fighting to get us here. So Cincinnati, we said we were coming, and here we are. And we are proud, so proud to be here in and celebrate the Queen City. Now aside from Mark and Donna, why have we come to Ohio? So let's see. Uh, Cincinnati is the home of the first professional baseball club in the United States, the Cincinnati Red Stockings, birthplace of the iconic 135-year-old ivory soap, and it still floats, <laughs> and home of the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. A reminder, a reminder to each and every one of us of the struggle for freedom yesterday today and tomorrow. For those who may not know, Cincinnati, this city, served as a northern terminus of the Underground Railroad, where thousands and thousands of slaves escaped to freedom by crossing the Ohio River. So it seems only appropriate and fitting that we would be here tonight to continue our path to freedom by building bridges over rivers of inequality and disparity and building bridges to jobs and justice. We've also come to celebrate the incredible work of all of our affiliates here in the state of Ohio. So at this time, I'd like to bring to the stage our Ohio Urban League affiliate, C. E O's. From the Urban League of Greater Cleveland, Marsha Maccabee. From the Akron Community Services Center and the Urban League in Akron, Ohio, Fred Wright. From the Greater Stark County Urban League in Canton, Ohio, Vincent Watts. From the Columbus Urban League, Stephanie Hightower. 
from the Lorain County Urban League in Elyria, Ohio, Paula Deason. From the Greater Warren Youngstown Urban League in Warren, Ohio, Tom Conley. And certainly last but not least, our hometown co-host from the Urban League of Greater Southwestern Ohio, Donna Jones Baker. <laughs> Urban League affiliates. Now each of them and their teams work tirelessly every day in, a com in communities across this state to make a positive impact on the lives of thousands of people looking for a bridge to a better life. On behalf of all of us in the Urban League movement, we want to thank each and every one of our affiliate CEOs, but especially on tonight, Donna and the Urban League affiliates here in the great state of Ohio for your partnership and for welcoming us to this city and this state with wide open arms. Now we've also come here to celebrate a very special milestone within our Urban League family. This year, our National Urban League young professionals turned 15 years old. And the difference uh, they continue to make is remarkable. So I'd like to recognize uh, the current leadership of the young professionals. Its president, Randy Richard, and the National Urban League YP Executive Board. Would they please? Over the past 15 years, hey, that was small and big, right? <laughs> Over the past 15 years, uh, the young professionals have changed the trajectory of the Urban League movement and uh, have helped to produce strong, effective CEOs who are infusing a new energy and passionate leadership into our affiliates across this nation. These currently include great and dynamic leaders like Nolan Rollins, who led the affiliate in New Orleans and is now in Los Angeles. <laughs> Kevin Hooks in Las Vegas, Jill Littlejohn in Greenville, South Carolina, Teddy McDaniel in Austin, Texas, and Erica McCondry Diggs in New Orleans, and many, many more are on the horizon. The YPs have helped to establish the National Urban League as a multi-generational civil rights movement. They've helped us to focus not just on serving and leading, but on teaching service and leadership and showing service and leadership ideals to a new generation. The YPs are you and I. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, I'm stopping right there. <laughs> but they are leaders of today and tomorrow. And based on what we've seen over 15 years, they are unstoppable. Congratulations, YPs. And happy 15th anniversary. Let's give them all a hand. All YPs, please stand. Let's give them a warm round of applause. Thank you very much. So we celebrate you, we appreciate you, and we can't wait to see where you will lead us. As Jordan mentioned, he did a great job, didn't he, Jordan Quinn? Yeah. We are also celebrating the 25th anniversary 
of our annual Youth Leaders Summit. We are so proud of our young women and young men like Jordan, who are impressive, who are smart, who are committed. And we're even more proud that we have played just some role in their development. We hope the skills and lessons, the dedication, the commitment, the service, the excellence that they have gained through the Urban League movement stay with them for a lifetime. So to all of our Youth Leadership Summit staff, alumni, current students, and volunteers, happy 25th anniversary. Keep pushing. Keep proving just how great you are. So all you Summit participants, please stand. All you Summit participants, let's celebrate. These young people. Now, uh, I can't leave it at that. We have to mention just another reason why we are excited to come to Cincinnati and Ohio. And that would be, uh, it's the home of the rubber band man, Bootsy Collins. <laughs> From uh, Parliament Funkadelic. And uh, it's also the home of the incomparable Ohio players. So you got a little taste of the players earlier, but wasn't enough for me. So who wouldn't love a place that produced musicians responsible for grooves like this? The one which we believe in. for the Ohio players. Now, uh, they turn the heat up with these, and this annual conference is about to do the same. We've all heard the saying, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the... If you can't stand the heat, get out of the... But what if the rest of the house is as hot as the kitchen? What if the fire is turned up in every room? What do we do when there's no place to hide? We can't hide. We cannot hide from our responsibility to realize the promise of Brown v. Board. We cannot hide from our responsibility to ensure equity in education, the need to reduce health disparities in communities of color. We cannot hide, and this nation cannot hide, from continued underemployment and double-digit unemployment as the new norm 
in too many urban communities across the nation. We cannot hide from the National Urban League State of Black America report, which this year showed a consistent two-to-one employment ratio for African Americans and the mainstream. Yes, in 2014, blacks are still twice as likely to be unemployed. And here's the truth. Four of the 10 metro areas in the nation with some of the highest black unemployment, over 20% are right here in Ohio. We can't hide. We can't hide from our responsibility to fight to make communities safer. We cannot fight from the need to end the scourge of gun violence in our neighborhoods. We cannot fight. We cannot hide from reforming and changing a criminal justice system that continues to disproportionately incarcerate our young men. We cannot hide from the need to reform a financial system that categorically denies people of color mortgages at a rate of 40 percent. And from any, any notions, ideas, or proposals for housing reform that does not include a commitment to affordable housing goals, we can not hide. The heat has been turned up, and we are in the midst of a fire. This year, our focus remains and continues to be on this idea that jobs rebuild America, jobs rebuild the nation, that a good job is the best anti-poverty program there is. And the Urban League movement, with our Jobs Rebuild America Economic Rescue Plan, committed last year when we announced in Cleveland, Ohio, a 100 million five-year, 50-community initiative to address the nation's employment and education crisis. We are doing it through what we call a tripod partnership between government, business, and nonprofits. And as part of Jobs Rebuild America, we are focusing throughout this year on the theme of one nation underemployed. Because my friends, we must highlight the critical issue of unemployment along with this emerging issue of underemployment. When people are unable to find jobs that match their education or skills. It's the case. It's a case of the teacher who's working as a cashier, or the business school graduate who is working at a fast food restaurant, or the banker who is now a bartender. Whether it's un or under employment, the decline in income is hindering the economic recovery of Main Street in cities across the nation, and leaving a devastating wake of down dreams, scattered hope, and floods of despair. As we come to Cincinnati, as we celebrate the renaissances that we see, we cannot hide from the difficult and challenging problems that this great nation faces. But we're not just looking at the growing problems our nation is facing. We are discussing them so that we can work towards solutions. Say solutions. So our focus for the next few days is building bridges, building bridges to jobs, building bridges to justice, and we have an impressive lineup. Tomorrow morning, the man from Scranton, Vice President Joe Biden, will be with us. 
We have mayors from eight great American cities, many of whom are right here on the front row, who are going to share what they are doing in their hometowns to confront the challenges that I've just described. And what uh, is working to improve this nation, community by community by community. On Friday, a dynamic plenary session will commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act. And we'll hear from Senator Rand Paul on Friday as well. Now, we have the Republican National Committee Chair, Reince Priebus, the Democratic National Committee Chair, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, and they'll both be addressing us over the next few days, as well as many others. Now, some people have asked me why we have invited some of these speakers. And while there is no need to name names, let me say this for the record. We have invited all of our speakers because we want the whole world to know that the road to the future and continued leadership comes right through here. You want to lead this nation? You got to come through the Urban League. You want to be responsible and believable on the challenges that face urban America? You've got to come through the Urban League. This is a place that no matter which side you sit on, you must come talk to us, engage with us, and we make no promises. We do not promise. We do not promise to agree on every point, but we must always have an open door for meaningful and constructive dialogue. The late, great Nelson Mandela once said, you see, no solution or compromise has ever been reached in silence. The National Urban League has always believed that the best way to solve problems is through building bridges of cooperation that cross all boundaries of race, class, culture, and ideology. That's how Lincoln succeeded in ending slavery and passing the 13th Amendment. That's how Dr. King, John Lewis, Lyndon Johnson, and our own Whitney M. Young led the fight for the passage of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. It's how Nelson Mandela and the African National Congress finally defeated apartheid in South Africa. History has shown us a consistent truth. It is only by talking, listening, and reasoning together that we build trust and stalemates and transform conflicts into solutions. It is our goal, and it is our hope, and it is our earnest belief that this conference can serve as an example of the kind of civil discourse and diversity of ideas that this nation needs today and that is essential to solving problems in our own nation and in a world with conflicts from the Middle East to Ukraine to the motherland in Africa. We live in a time of tremendous crisis abroad and at home. This empowerment movement that we talk about is not a movement of hate and division but one in which people commit themselves to finding and implementing solutions. That's why we are convening a diverse lineup of speakers in Cincinnati. That's why young people, women of power, business executives, mayors, educators, political leaders, teachers, and others are about to set our minds on fire with progressive, yes, some conservative, and other points of view. We don't have to adopt every view that is presented to us, but we should not devolve into a place where we stop listening, or worse, where we stop respecting each other. Do you hear me, Washington, D.C.? Do you hear me, Washington, D.C.?
Now for the rest of our time together this evening, I want to take you on a journey. It's a journey of progress and retrogression, commemoration and continuation, past victories and, yes, new threats. Three weeks ago today, we celebrated 50 years since the signing of the Civil Rights Act. And it is a story that is an important one to remember. In those days, the images and the music told the stories of those who'd been silenced and voiced the leaderships and hardships facing people of color as they sought a fair shot at an elusive American dream. Much of what the Civil Rights Act accomplished is obvious. It desegregated hotels, lunch counters, retail stores, theaters. It banned discrimination in employment based on race, sex, gender, and religion. It was the most important law in the history of our republic. In fact, it was more than a law. It changed the direction of this nation. Formerly segregated cities like Atlanta and Houston and Dallas and Birmingham and New Orleans and Charlotte, which were great cities, have been transformed into great international destinations because of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And perhaps most importantly, the Civil Rights Act gave our children a chance. It gave you and me, as the children of that generation, the chance to walk through doors and be able to imagine the impossible. It gave us a chance to know that the change that so many fought and died for was here, yet there was more still to come. It gave us a chance to dream big dreams, and it showed us that where opportunity did not exist, we could create it. Where hope was dying, we could revive it. Where bridges didn't exist, we could build them. Please take a look at the screen. I think I 
Ladies and gentlemen, that was Sam Cooke from Clarksdale, Mississippi. Sam Cooke, 50 years ago, Martin Luther King, Whitney Young, and John Lewis built a bridge to jobs and justice. That courageous and canny Texan, President Lyndon Johnson, built a bridge when he signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And in the same year, declared a war on poverty. 50 years ago, those bridges were built with blood. They were built with sweat. They were built with tears. They were built with suffering. And yes, with coalition building that crossed generations and political parties. That generation. They crossed those bridges together. They were Democrats and Republicans. They were black, they were white, they were Latino, and they were Asian. That generation, they were Jews, Gentiles, Protestants, Catholics, and Muslims. They crossed those bridges together. And when they did, this America, this nation, the stars and stripes emerged from the darkness into the light of the 20th century. That generation, they taught us that building bridges takes cooperation and the willingness to do what's best for community and nation. But building bridges is not party time. Building bridges requires sacrifice, hard work, the willingness to risk, the courage to challenge, and an indistinguishable fire in the soul. 50 years ago, young people on that bridge in Selma, young people sitting in in Greensboro, North Carolina, and in cities across the South. Young people riding buses all over this nation challenged convention and the status quo. Young people like Schwerner, Goodman, and Cheney may made the ultimate sacrifice down in Philadelphia, Mississippi, they lost their lives trying to do good. These were the fuel for so many of the challenges and the changes we've witnessed since then. Now, 50 years later, the National Urban League and the Urban League movement continue to do the work that was seeded and planted in those days. And we are stronger individually and collectively than ever. We are. We are the generation of beneficiaries. We are the beneficiaries of that struggle and that sacrifice, and we better not forget it. We better not forget it. This mighty Urban League movement's commitment for 104 years is to expanding opportunity for all low-income and working-class Americans. It's part of the bedrock of progress, making it possible for every one of us to aspire to greatness, to compete for the choicest opportunities, to work in service to others, to pay it forward. Challenges and opportunities facing our communities abound. But we cannot allow the work that lies ahead to diminish the accomplishments that we've made. Each of us in this room carrying, 
carrying the baton of progress into the 21st century. You see, despite how far we've come, we still have much to celebrate, or I should say, despite how far we have not come, we still have much to celebrate. Just yesterday, President Obama signed into law a new bipartisan jobs bill addressing urban and youth unemployment. You didn't hear about it too much because it got 400 votes plus in the House and I believe 90 votes plus in the Senate. If it had been a food fight, had it been a partisan battle, we would have all heard about it. So we want to congratulate the President and the Congress for finding common ground. Those of you, my affiliate colleagues in the trench, my staff colleagues know that this bill was a result of more than 10 years of fighting and working and marching. That's right, 10 years. The halls of Congress, letters and emails and the like for renewal of this nation's preeminent job training legislation of advocating for and championing the Urban Jobs Act, of working days and nights and weekends to ensure that essential local youth provisions were included in the bill that would help to reduce youth unemployment, strengthen our economy, and give millions of young people and young people of color access to education and skills needed for success in work and life. This battle was finally won, thanks in large part to the special commitment of Senator Kristen Gillibrand of New York and Representative Shaka Fatah of Pennsylvania. They stood up, they stepped up. And they heard the Urban League's message. But all of you played a role and it could not have been done with each of you. And when I say you, who am I referring to? All of you. The chair of the National Urban League Board, John Hoffmeister, who will join us tomorrow. All of our board members whose support and counsel and passion for the Urban League movement are always evident and never expendable. My Urban League colleagues on Wall Street and in Washington, the staff, you never fail to amaze me with your commitment to our cause and your unrelenting spirit to change lives, empower communities, and change our world. Our affiliate CEOs led by Darnell Williams of Boston, you are our arms, legs, heart, and soul. <laughs> Carrying forward our mission and our message in communities all across the nation. I have the special opportunity to visit with many of you each year, and I'm always humbled and proud to see the difference we are making for those who need it the most. And to all of our supporters and partners, volunteers, our ever-committed guilders led by Cynthia Stokes Murray, those who believe in the power of what we do to create the world in which we want to live in, I am renewed every day by your spirit of service and your well of giving to our movement, our people, our communities, and our nation. What we accomplish every day, every year, every month because of you, we could not have accomplished. And we could not have accomplished what we have over the last 10 years without you. And nothing we accomplished in the next 10 years will happen without each of you on this journey with us. Every year, you continue to do more. In fact, in 2013, you made a difference by providing assistance, Urban League colleagues, to two million people. You made a difference by providing workforce development, job placing, placement counseling to more than 67,000 people by placing more than 14,000 people last year alone in jobs with salaries that exceeded the minimum wage. You made a difference. You made a difference by operating entrepreneurship centers that provided business training to almost 12,000 small business clients and by creating or saving an additional 1,000 plus jobs. You made a difference by reaching almost 800,000 people with health care services 
and information. And you served over 150,000 students through National Urban League signature programs like Project Ready. And despite budget reductions, you helped us serve 68,000 people in need of home ownership. Those are a lot of numbers. They add up. But here's the point. You're not talking. You're working. You're not acting. You're facting. You are making a difference in communities across the nation. Give yourselves another round of applause. But I want to take a look at uh, the last 10 years very quickly. In the last 10 years, in the last 10 years, the Urban League movement, our affiliates have provided services to 17 million people. 17 million people. <laughs> Healthcare services to 6.6 million clients. 2.2 million students and adults with education services. And in the last 10 years, you've put 155,000 people to work. And you've helped 1,000 new businesses get started. We've also assisted more than 1.5 million people through other program activities ranging from ex-offender reentry and storm relief to tax pre preparation and transportation for the elderly. And finally, we've made an economic impact on this nation that exceeds $9 billion. <laughs> you know, colleagues, we gotta have the numbers, right? We gotta have the metrics. We gotta have the facts. This is the work that you do. These are the lives you change. And in that spirit, I want to encourage you to do something a little different tonight. I want you to take out your phones or tablets and keep them out. Don't call your cousin and don't call your girlfriend or surf the internet. But we'll be using your mobile device in a few minutes to do something important. What you are going to witness tonight is empowerment in action. The Urban League is a do tank. We don't just talk about it, we are about it. And you are to be celebrated for pushing and serving and refusing to be satisfied with the status quo. For everything you've done and will do, we celebrate you tonight. Give yourselves, and importantly, your works, another big hand. In the last 10 years, we've gotten bigger, stronger, and more impactful. You are serving more and you are doing more and you have new leaders with new visions, new energy and new passion, but also with a historic commitment to the mission and to the ridding of America of inequality and inequity that has always prevented our nation from being its best. You're operating with more focus and efficiency under our five point empowerment agenda and 2025 goals around jobs, education, housing and health more specialized professional development, training for Urban League affiliate staff, board members, and board chairs is helping to ensure that you have the development you need to be successful at all levels, from finances to fundraising to managing organizations and talent. Our standard is high, but your aspirations for your communities are higher. Over the past 10 years, you've gathered 300 strong in Washington, D.C. each year for our legislative policy conference to ensure that the needs of the people in the 300 communities we serve are not only heard, but acted on by the White House, members of Congress, and the Cabinet. Your voices are the voices of millions. You've not only said, I am empowered, you've spread the message that we are empowered, and without a doubt, we're doing our part, but we want to do more. We intend to do more. We will do more. Because 50 years after the crowning victories of the civil rights movement, we face a new threat. And it's an ominous one trying to prevent this nation from fully moving forward. Attempts to strip us of progress and the promise of equality in this nation. This new threat seeks to divide the Congress 
to say not only do we not support a minimum wage, but we're not going to allow it to come to a vote. One that says we know guns are killing our citizens at higher rates than all of the wars in our nation's history, but we will not pass gun safety legislation because the gun lobby is more powerful than our love for one another. This new threat, this new threat employs obstructionist filibusters and other efforts aimed at halting progress and preserving inequality by such shenanigans as stalling on the confirmation of judges, stalling on the voting on critical issues like minimum wage and immigration. This new threat wants to make a mockery of the words on the Statue of Liberty would say, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be breathe free. This new threat forgets that America is now and has always been a nation of immigrants. The diversity and multi-ethnic gumbo of people who built this nation is our most valuable asset. It's one of our greatest strengths. And this is even truer today as the challenges and opportunities of globalization bind us even closer and make us more interdependent. Martin Luther King reminded us we are caught in an escapable network of mutuality, tied in a garment that is single of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all directly. Immigration reform is consistent with our values as a nation and as an Urban League movement, and it's consistent with our commitment to civil rights and social justice. We will not align ourselves with intolerance and bigotry against any community in this nation. The proposed solutions have not been perfect, but they are better than the broken system that we have, and it's now time to fix it, this new threat doesn't just walk the halls of Congress. There are governors across America who do not want Medicaid to be expanded in states that have the largest numbers of poor people or who support positive education reform that oppose it in the name of political aspirations over what is best for our children. These are just examples of the new threats. This new threat pretends that our nation has not been made better by all of the fruits of the Civil Rights Movement, the Civil Rights Act, and the Voting Rights Act, Affirmative Action, Brown v. Board, and so much more, that our nation is not better because of the sacrifices of LBJ and Martin Luther King and Whitney Young and John Lewis and Dorothy Height and Fannie Lou Hamer, and that legion of Urban League affiliate CEOs in the 1960s and 70s. America is better for its work towards equality for all citizens, and this nation is at its best when we collectively understand that all people are created equal, all people are imbued with certain inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and I would add economic opportunity and empowerment. This is an idea not only embedded in our Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, but ingrained in our hearts and in the DNA of our souls. When I stood before you 11 years for the first time in 2003, I talked about a fellow by the name of James Crow Esquire. James Crow, the younger, more sophisticated, erudite, well-dressed and well-mannered little brother of Jim Crow. And let me tell you a little more. James is Jim's son. And we defeated uh, Jim Crow in the 20th century when uh, we legislated uh, equality, when separation was outlawed, and at various points over the past 50 years, we thought that good old Jim Crow was just a painful part of our past. 
and we wanted to forget about him. But I have this sense that he's being revived. Meet Jim Crow Esquire, the disguised, not so obvious, structural inequality that keeps popping up, alive and well, even 50 years after the Civil Rights Movement. James didn't return alone. He's back. He's got Mary, Charlie, Bobby. He's got the whole Crow family. And I call them the new Crows. The new Crows are bringing in a new, as disturbing level of intolerance. It's intolerance based on gender. It's based on orientation. It's based on religion. And just about anything else that doesn't fit a myopic view of what it means to be an American. They are the forces with sophisticated talking points that want to turn back the hands of time. These are the forces that want to divide this nation and make it more difficult for people to engage in democracy. There's no sadder time in this great nation when some people deem that their only means of progression is through the regression of others. This is not America at its best. You see this new threat. It isn't from Main Street or the mainstream. It's a small group of people, the Crow cronies. They've got loud voices. Some have deep pockets. They're saying no to voting rights. They're saying no to the lies of our children. They're saying yes to gun lobbyists over the safety of our streets. They're saying no to the minimum wage. They're saying no to increases in policies and opportunities that could help close the income and wealth defy. They're saying no to high quality education for all of our kids. So how do we quell these new threats? Now is the time to build a new bridge across the divide of voter suppression. Like LBJ said, there is no inalienable right more fundamental to our democracy than the right to vote. It's the most powerful instrument ever devised by man for breaking town injustice. Expanding the opportunity to vote in America has always been intended to foster more more than ensuring that people have a voice, that African-American politicians get elected. It's more than that. By opening the political process, the Voting Rights Act has enriched the discussion of politics in America and made a broader pool of talent available to improving the quality of representation for all people everywhere. The great strides in the expansion of democracy that America has achieved have come only because of the laws that have been in place. Yet, a year ago, the United States Supreme Court dismantled and crushed a key provision of the Voting Rights Act when it ruled Section 4 unconstitutional. What has been the result? Since January 2013, voter suppression measures have been threatened, passed, or announced in 15 states including right here in Ohio. Consider that in the first four months of 2013 alone, restrictive voting bills were introduced in more than half the states, half. The picture could get no clearer. The Voting Rights Act was necessary in 1965 and it remains so in 2014. <laughs> now is also the time to build a bridge to living wages. Imagine working 40 hours a week and having to choose between paying for food for your kids or your rent or your light bill. This is the real case of millions of Americans who are the working poor. They get up every day. They go to work each morning. They want to earn an honest and decent living. But even though they work, even though they struggle, they simply don't make enough to support their families. The case for increasing the minimum wage is simple. Make it a living wage. Pay people for the work that they do. 
because adjustments in the minimum wage have not kept pace with increases in the cost of living. The current minimum wage is not enough for many people to survive. If the current federal minimum wage, now at $7.25 an hour, had kept pace with inflation, it would be nearly $10.60 an hour. Now, America has some of the most productive workers in the world. If the minimum wage had kept pace with worker productivity, another important economic measure, it would be $21.72 per hour. The majority of jobs created since the recession have been in low-wage occupations. And raising the minimum wage is critical to slowing the trend toward growing wage inequality. The National Urban League supports the Fair Minimum Wage Act, which proposes a minimum wage to $10.10 per hour by next year and index it for inflation. And we send a message to Congress, it's time for you to vote it, yes or no. And it would give, it would give immediately 30 million people, 30 million Americans, half of whom are people of color, 4.7 working moms are raised to support their families, to pay them for the work they do. So I'm urging you to act with us right now. Grab those phones and tablets and let's get ready. We launched a petition in April to raise the minimum wage. It's on our website at www.nul.org. It's accessible via text. So right now, I'd like for you to support our effort to get Congress to raise the minimum wage by texting RAISE, R-A-I-S-E, to 69866. Get those phones out, R-A-I-S-E to 69866. Follow the instructions you receive back, reply with your full name and email address, and once done, we'll send you a thank you message. So please join us, and I encourage you to post this to your social networks and get your friends to text and hashtag raise the wage. I'm personally asking you to join us in signing our minimum wage petition. Our message to Congress is clear. We will act even when you won't. Now is the time to build a new bridge, a new bridge across the dollar and digital divides. Building bridges, building bridges to jobs and justice is why we are here in Cincinnati. And it also means we cannot turn a vast eye to the disparities that exist in income, wealth, and digital. The situation is clear. The economic recovery has simply been insufficient in the job and wealth creation necessary to revive and restore all that was lost in the recession. What we see emerging from the rubble is a state of black America in severe economic crisis. Millions of middle class and low income Americans have been left in post-recession ICU with diagnoses of unemployment, underemployment, home losses, foreclosures, low or no savings, and retirement accounts, credit denials, cuts in education, and school funding. We cannot turn a blind eye, nor can we turn a blind eye to the disparities that exist in the digital realm. We also must work to ensure more broadband in the hand of every American, more computers in the classroom, increased STEM education, corporate diversity, all of these is, are a start, but they are not the end. The build out of the internet and broadband infrastructure is and will be a driver of American job creation. And to deliver on the promise of broadband innovation and other wireless services that are changing America as we know it, minority and women-owned businesses must have a meaningful seat at the table, not just as service providers or mobile app developers, but as licensees and owners of Spectrum. The challenge before all of us, the wireless industry, the Federal Communications Commission, is to understand that closing the digital divide is no longer just about access to the internet. 
but it's about access to the jobs and the wealth that the internet is creating. Now is the time. Now is the time to build a new bridge across the divide of inequitable education. Mandela told us education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. And as we endeavor to change the world by building bridges to education for all children, I have recently spoken out, as many of you have, in support of common core state standards. And more importantly, the equitable implementation of these common core state standards. And the Urban League's belief that the standards are an element of this nation's effort to better prepare all students for success in college and career. I made a, uh, what some may have considered a controversial choice to do this, considering how much of a lightning rod this topic has become. But let's be clear about one thing. The National Urban League has not, will not, and should not cower in the face of controversy. For us, this is not about politics. This is not about the fallout. In the words of uh, that great congressman from the city of St. Louis, Bill Clay Sr., we must remember we have no permanent friends, we have no permanent enemies, we only have permanent interests. And those, and those interests are the interests of our children. No deception, no distortion, no fear-mongering, no misrepresentations will turn our focus from working to ensure that our children have access to high-quality education that prepares them for, for success. We will not play political ping-pong with our children's future. Sixty years since Brown, and that ruling ended segregation in public schools. Yet separate but unequal resources and expectations have remained the reality for too many of our students. The recent NAEP uh, study, the National Assessment of Education Progress, found that only 16% of black students are reading at or above grade level compared with 44% of white students, a gap of 28%. All of our children deserve better. And setting common, high academic standards offers real potential for addressing the achievement gap facing the nation. It is clear that a high school diploma does not necessarily mean that graduates will be prepared for higher education or for the world of work. Our children deserve to know that no matter where they live, what school district, school, or classroom they're in, whether they're in Cleveland, Detroit, Buckhead, or Beverly Hills, that they must have access to high quality education and are provided with the necessary resource to achieve the same. In other words, our education system should focus on more than equality. It should focus on equity. But this has not been the case. Before Common Core state standards, every state wrote its own learning standards. They did it in English and math on their own. And instead of sharing best practices, everyone was on their own. As a result, many state standards did not keep pace with what students needed to know to be ready for college, work, and life, leading those students unprepared. It does not serve our nation or our future when some children are systematically less prepared than others, nor does it serve our nation to have this issue tossed into a political minefield when it becomes a casualty of partisanship and deliberate misinformation. These standards, these common core state standards, clearly define the knowledge and skills that every student, kindergarten through grade 12, should have in English and math by the end of each school year. That's it. It's not a curriculum. It doesn't tell teachers how to teach. It doesn't tell administrators how to run their schools. It simply says that consistent learning goals for all students will set us on a path to where we no longer routinely have different expectations and thus different successes and different outcomes for different students. 
I'm talking about a world where every student can be an astronaut, an inventor, an engineer, a doctor, a developer, or an Urban League CEO, or a Supreme Court Justice, or the President of the United States. And it can come true if they have been adequately prepared to reach their full potential. All of our children deserve a chance. All of our children can win. And the equitable implementation of Common Core, ensuring that states, districts, schools, principals, and teachers have the resources they need to be successful is a start. When we build bridges to education, we build bridges to opportunity. Now is the time to build new bridges when we refuse to accept housing finance reform that doesn't include affordable housing goals, when we stand, shout, and march against police brutality and the use of excessive force and the disproportionate killing and incarceration of young men, when we hold the feet of Congress to the fire to pass transportation infrastructure bills, vote on the minimum wage, we build bridges. We build bridges to wealth, to reform, to jobs, to better wages. Now, 50 years later, this nation must finish its business. And civil rights is still America's unfinished business. I'm asked always about the future of the civil rights movement. I'm here to tell you, this is the future of the civil rights movement. We are the future of the civil rights movement and our efforts will continue to evolve with the needs of those we serve. Why our youth may not possess memories of the struggles of 50 years ago, because those struggles took place well before they were born. They are still part of that struggle, not just for basic rights, but for economic empowerment. They may uh, no longer have to fight to sit at the lunch counter, but what's the use of winning a fight to sit at the lunch counter if they can't afford the meal? Their struggle is not just about affording the meal, but being able to afford to buy the entire restaurant. Our question, our question is, where do we go from here? Well, as long as uh, people are out of work and young men continue to senselessly lose their lives at the whim of police officers or at each other or uh, at the hands of wannabe neighborhood watch personnel wielding guns loaded with racism. As long as there are children in need of better schools and quality after school and early childhood education, as long as there are people looking to become homeowners or simply looking somewhere to turn. This Urban League movement will fight from here. We will fight from Florida to Fruitvale, from Staten Island to Rikers Island, from Chicago to Ohio. Civil rights champions and warriors, we have challenges before us, but we celebrate our journey because we have a clear vision of a better tomorrow. We face new threats, but we celebrate our impact in communities across the nation. We have more work to do but we celebrate a better future. That is why we proudly wear our armor and begin each day anew. You see, we're happy when we're fighting for justice. We're happy when we're pushing towards economic empowerment. We're happy when our children are getting the best. We're happy because we celebrate what will be, not just what is, we're happy when we're helping people find jobs. We are happy when we're knocking down the walls of injustice. We're happy when we're marching people to the polls to vote. And when we see the doors of opportunity fly open. We're happy when a child who didn't have success becomes a great scientist, a principal, an educator, on an entrepreneur. We're happy when we see a Jordan Quinn stand before us in a suit and tie and represent the next generation of leaders. We're happy because whether we're in Kansas or Kentucky, in Cincinnati or in Akron, in Canton 
or in Baltimore or in Boston, we are on the shoulders of greatness. We're happy because the work we do together, the work we do together as CEOs, as board members, as grassroots leaders, as educators, as guilders, as young professionals, as mayors, as supporters, it's made this nation stronger. It's made this Urban League movement stronger. We are happy because our mission is not an empty mission. It's a mission of purpose. We're happy because your calling and my calling and our calling is a just calling. We are happy because we're here with you. We're happy to be in Cincinnati and we're happy because we are one Urban League movement in purpose, in passion, in empowerment. We're happy because we are one nation, one nation under God, with liberty, justice, and economic empowerment for all. We're happy. We're happy because we're infused, infused with the energy of yesterday. We're happy because we have great hopes for tomorrow. We're happy because the baton has been handed to us. It's been handed to us time and time again. And we're happy because we're strong enough to run the next leg in the race. We're happy. We're happy because we've been chosen to lead. We're happy. We're happy. We're happy. We're happy. And God bless all of you. God bless all of you. And we're happy because we're God's children. And we're happy. So by the powers invested in me, I now declare the National Urban League Conference officially open. God bless you. Because I'm